In 2019, our exhibit at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition was a celebration of the creation of the periodic table by Dmitri Mendeleev 150 years ago. To celebrate, we created a very special periodic table of life. We asked the questions, which elements created life? Which elements do our bodies need today? And which elements can we use in medicine? But we emphasize that it's not just the element in yellow that matters, it's the chemical speciation of that element that determines its biological properties. And it's understanding that chemical speciation that is a major challenge for research in the future. To bring the periodic table to life, a highly talented electronics technician at the University of Warwick, Rod Vesson, designed and built a very special periodic table containing 1,062 LEDs, all hand-coloured, hand-wired and hand-soldered. It took several months and weighs a third of a tonne and took us over two hours to assemble it at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. Some visitors wrote their names in chemical elements. Others checked that their cornflakes are indeed magnetic. In fact, you can extract the magnetism from cornflakes by crushing them up in a little bit of water and attracting the magnetism from cornflakes to a, a powerful magnet on the sides of a container. And if you take those particles, their micrometer-sized particles, and measure their magnetism, it's characteristic of elemental metallic iron. Let's hear now about some of our recent research. Ross Rickaby and her team have made important discoveries about the crucial role of trace metals in the lives of the most ancient organisms on this earth. So life has taken advantage of the chemistry that is available to it and we can see in this periodic table how life has generally used the elements that are most abundant. But that abundance has changed through time as a result of oxygenation in the ocean and the atmosphere. And that has made iron insoluble, manganese insoluble, and they have dropped out of the ocean and resulted in vanishingly low levels in the modern ocean today. Meanwhile, zinc was locked up in insoluble sulphides until oxygen rose high enough to oxidise and release that zinc and raise the concentrations in the ocean. And we showed last year on the stand with our perspex uh, cells the differences in chemistry between the very simple prokaryotes, the bacterial life that were living when oxygen levels were low and iron levels were high, and the eukaryotes, the more complicated cells that have evolved in the more oxygenated world. And they have these different chemistries with prokaryotes, bacteria, requiring high levels of iron and manganese but very low levels of zinc. Meanwhile eukaryotes have streamlined their iron and manganese requirements but instead require awfully large amounts of zinc. And these metal requirements have actually shaped their niches and the ecosystem of the plankton in the modern ocean and this is what we've been doing in the last year is being showing where red colours show where organisms are not limited by elements, blue colours show where organisms are limited by elements, and we can see these different patterns of limitation of the bacteria uh, by iron in the majority of the ocean and that iron limitation is alleviated in some parts of the low latitude where we see the bright colours here. Um, uh, whereas uh, the, the, the prokaryotes are able to grow abundantly with regards to manganese and zinc. By contrast, the eukaryotes, the larger cells able to pump more carbon to the deep ocean, generally are not limited by iron and manganese. They've streamlined their physiologies because they're used to those low levels, but they're, they're limited in some parts of the low latitude ocean by zinc. And this shapes the power of the biological pump of carbon to depth in the ocean as a result of these different metal requirements. We've just heard that the more complex an organism, the more zinc it requires. This is also true for humans. No less than 10% of our proteins require zinc. However, both too much and too little zinc can lead to cell death. The Blimlauer team at the University of Warwick studies how organisms make sure that their cells receive the right amount of zinc. And here is one example and how things can go wrong. In our blood plasma, albumin is the main zinc carrier. Albumin also carries other molecules, including fatty acids. We have found that fatty acid binding impairs the ability of albumin to bind zinc. Now, in diabetes or obesity, the levels of fatty acid in plasma are constantly increased. This leads to zinc binding to the wrong proteins, 
and also to increase the uptake of zinc by cells of the blood vessels. We hope that our future studies on the consequences of these events will lead to better understanding and treatment. Interestingly, one of the thousands of proteins that require zinc for action is ACE2, the cell surface protein that facilitates entry of SARS coronaviruses into cells. It is also intriguing that the drug dexamethasone that is now used to treat COVID-19 leads to cells producing high amounts of the zinc binding protein metallothionine. But let's hear now from Margaret. She has discovered that another trace element may also play an important role in recovery from COVID-19. Thank you, Claudia. Well, uh, Claudia was mentioning another element, and that element is actually selenium, which you see here at number 34. Now, selenium is known to be important to human health because it's part of a series of selenoproteins, of one of which is shown here, glutathione peroxidase, which is an antioxidant and has antioxidant um, properties. Now, it may be that it is these selenoproteins that are part of the reason that selenium is known to be um, beneficial in reducing viral infections or reducing their severity. Now, um, there's one part of the world which is notable for low selenium status, and that is China. And this pale pink area here is, is um, an area of low soil selenium, which means people are getting not very much selenium in their diet. I'm showing here Wuhan, which is where the, um, the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 started, of course. But what we thought we would do is look for, try and um, find rates of cure rates in different Chinese cities and see whether that had any relationship with selenium status in those cities. So cure rate was available for um, every date really during the, the pandemic in China. And we chose the date of the 18th of February and we have the cure rate for a range of 17 cities here. And what we've also got is China, the city population hair selenium so it's not the same as intake, but it's proportional to intake. So you can take it as being more or less equivalent. And what we found was a significant correlation between cure rate and selenium status in these Chinese cities. And this tells us that probably um, selenium is relevant to uh, recovering from COVID-19 disease. But of course, all we've observed is a correlation and it, it may well be that but what you actually need is a randomized control trial to show whether there's a real effect. Elements that are not essential for life can also play a role in medicine as therapeutic or diagnostic agents. In the Sadler group, we focus on drugs based on metals. For example, cisplatin and other platinum agents are very important in cancer chemotherapies. Other metals from the precious metal area of the periodic table are also interesting as anti-cancer agents. However, these drugs are often non-specific to cancer cells and may lead to side effects. Therefore, in the Sadler group, we investigate metallodrugs that can be switched on by light, such as the LED lights you can see here, so that we can produce anti-cancer agents specifically where the tumour is. In this work with my colleague Dr. Shi, we attach a vitamin B7 to our metallodrugs to make it more specific to cancer cells. We saw that our compound was non-toxic to cancer cells in the dark, but had a profound impact when irradiated, with cell nuclei fragmentation and bursting of the cells. So, Jinju has shown you how controlling the speciation of platinum, here shown in yellow, is very important in the design of new anti-cancer drugs. She takes visible light and activates this compound, converting it from a relatively harmless, non-toxic platinum compound into one that can kill cancer cells. But how can we find out if this really happens inside cancer cells? Well, Lizzie is going to show you now how we use some new techniques at the Diamond Synchrotron. We use x-rays for looking inside cancer cells, and we can see natural elements in those cancer cells, and we can see the metallodrugs inside those cells. As Chintzia mentioned earlier, we're also interested in metallodrugs for the treatment of cancer. 
In our research group, we've been investigating iridium complexes, which can be activated with light to selectively kill the cancer cells. But what we wanted to know is what these complexes were doing on a subcellular level. And to do this, we can use synchrotron radiation. So the first technique we used was cryosoft x-ray tomography. And this is a technique which can be used to gain 3D biological information on our treated cancer cells down to a subcellular organelle level, so as close to their native state as possible. And from this, what we found was that the mitochondrial organelles in cancer cells, which are responsible for generating energy, were significantly smaller in cells treated with our iridium complex upon blue light irradiation. So this likely implicates mitochondria in their mechanism of action. We can also use X-ray fluorescence to generate elemental maps of our treated cancer cells. So this means that we can map where our heavy metal drugs are with respect to biological elements such as zinc, which is highly localized in the cell nucleus. This can provide information on the distribution and cellular targets of our metallodrugs in cancer cells. Understanding the role of the chemical elements in evolution, in health, in disease, and the design of new medicines is intimately concerned with understanding their chemical speciation. It's a formidable challenge, but one we can now face up to with the use of new techniques and new methods that are becoming available. And it really is a very exciting field for future research.